Thank you for auditing the always positive new music review show hosted by a French professor who once again will be reviewing a recently reissued album by Mock Hami, this one from 2013, FYI. I don't know when I'm going to get to the end of this well. You see, I started reviewing his albums last year, and he keeps reissuing these albums, which gives me an excuse to listen to his old music. And, and I have the sense of, like, taking a penny and throwing it down a well to hear when it's going to splash and figure out, like, when have I gotten to the bottom of Makami? When have I actually sort of gotten to the end of the depths of this musician? Well, after listening to this project, I can tell you I have not heard a splash. I just still hear that whistle of that penny going whoosh. Production-wise, this is probably my third favorite project. After Balan Show and Pray for Haiti, I think his most recent work is his best work. But I love the, the, the play with space on this album in terms of the, the production. Uh, the beats are just, they have different modes and different moments. I love his voice on here. It's still got the dynamics where he has a couple different flows. But he's lacking, I don't know, like in his newer stuff, there's a sort of harshness that can come into his voice, which is nice for a change. But I don't hear that here. Like, the best example is, instead of him saying, yeah, like, he just sort of says, yeah. But what interests me the most about this, and why I think this is such a, a deep well to explore, is what he's saying. Now, on the one hand, there's a, there's a personal component to this album, where it seems like a lot of it's about growing up, about moving on from his youth, moving on from maybe his hopes, maybe addressing his uh, disappointments, accepting his disappointments, not falling for the simple traps, maturing, lamenting his losses. But on the other hand, this is one of the most black militant hip hop albums I've ever heard. And I'm including the heyday, the native tongues heyday and the public enemy heyday. In a way, this is the perfect album to come out during Black History Month. My apologies to Kanye and Black Future Month. Um, but it's interesting because, obviously, in the rest of the work that I've heard of Makami, so I've heard about four of his other projects now, the political aspect is there. But here, it's really up front. And, you know, it sort of makes me sad because HBO, which would follow this, we'll see much more of a shift towards talking more about crime and the life of crime and dog food and, and, and sort of criminality, which I think is, is a little bit of a shame. But at the same time, uh, it's really hard to talk about Makami um, and say that he's done anything wrong because he acts in such an interesting way. He moves in such an intentionally mysterious way that I always suspect whenever I have a criticism for what he's doing, he's actually doing something else that I don't quite understand. What did this album make me do? Well, uh, th things are going well for me on Patreon. I'm going to say that. Um, I really appreciate it. I'll talk about that at the end. Um, but I've got a little extra money kicking around. I use that money to buy albums, to, to support artists. But a lot of the artists that I want to support haven't released physical versions, etc., etc. So I had some money, and what I did was I spent it on Amazon. Because Makami has given you and me, a reading list. Now, the reading list is at least probably 10 books long. I only got six books for reasons I'll explain. And to a certain extent, it's a, it's a, it's, it might seem bizarre. Makami has been quoted as saying that he doesn't read. Here's a quote from an LA Record article in 2017. And I apologize for being in the basement again. I'm still testing positive for COVID 10 days later. Omicron. Here's the quote from Makami. I don't give an F about no school. People think I read books. I don't read books. I'd be outside. I'd be with the people who you're afraid to look at their social media profile. So there he is, Makami, trying to tell us he doesn't read. While earlier in that same paragraph of that same interview, he is, and I am not kidding, talking about Hegelian dialectics. I was eating lunch with my son, and we were both talking about how difficult it is to understand Hegel. He said, but dad, aren't you a philosophical master? I said, no, I've studied a little bit of philosophy, but I don't understand Hegel. There's no human being on planet Earth who refers to Hegelian dialectics who does not also read. So I think when he says he doesn't read, I think what he's saying is he doesn't want to be pigeonholed. He doesn't want to be seen as the person who likes people who read books kind of rapper. <clears throat> you know, just last night, 
I watched the, the new Kanye documentary, and he's discussing his position in between Raucous Records and Rockefeller Records, meaning in between sort of back school, uh, backpack rap and hardcore gangster rap. And Kanye is very important to him to be in between there. Makami is another one of these intermediate figures who can be appealing to the backpackers and can be appealing to the people who want the street raps. So it's much easier to be well-read and say, I don't read, and be taken seriously, as opposed to saying, being well-read and saying, I read really well, because you might end up alienating. and might, It might seem as though you're trying to distance yourself from the streets. I could spend an hour unpacking that last sentence, and actually I feel a little bit bad saying it, because creating this kind of uh, this, this, this opposition between the streets and being well-read, that's not what this channel's about. But if someone would like to call me out and make a response video attacking me for the underlying racism of that offhanded comment, I will not only support you, I will link, I will link to it on my channel because there's a lot of things that were implied in what I just said uh, that, are, uh, that point to systematic flaws. So here we have Makami who claims he doesn't read. Obviously it's not true. And in this album, more than any other, he appears to be giving us a politically conscious book reading list. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you Professor Skye's Professor Skye's mock-inspired Black History Month reading list. Don't forget, the name of the album is FYI, for your information. And the information that we're getting is very, very deep. And a lot of it is about information that is hidden from us the racist education system, which is millennia old, has been hiding things from us. And, and in order to not participate in that system, in order to not be totally happy people participating in the white supremacist view of history, which is alive and well, no matter how much people are pretending that CRT is making some kind of difference in the world, in order for us to actually fight that, we have to call ourselves out and say, we've been hiding. We're not looking. Makami, through this album, is making us look. And me, through this review, is going to help tell you where he's telling you to look. Because there's one great thing about Makami that's one of the most frustrating things. is He gives you everything you need, but he doesn't care at all if you get it. <laughs> he just doesn't care. You get what he says, you don't get what he says. So be it. He is not leading anybody anywhere. He's leaving everything on the table, and you have to figure out how to get there. So let's get to the album, okay? This will include the first book report, first of my, you know, five book reports I'm gonna be giving in this review. And it's the stamp of the album, it's the first track, Midrash. Just a great track. Typical sort of opening track for a Makami album, kind of laid back. What, what kids today would call a vibe, uh, start, has this cool organ. So like there's a little bit of organ and he'll rap over it and then he'll take a break and then the organ will do a little solo. That's that space I'm talking about. Now, weirdly enough, for an album that is filled with black, uh, black revolutionaries, the opening quote is from Steve Jobs, sort of talking about Microsoft. And I think this is announcing the shift in Makami's work away from the political and a little bit more towards the sort of straight rap, street rap. But still, this beautiful song has got this bass rumbling underneath. Listen to it on headphones if you can. It's groovy, it's funky, and it just leaves all this space where he raps and raps and raps and then this little organ goes. Um, and then one of the lines that I find most interesting, and this is where the whole idea for the, the book report came from. <clears throat> no doubt about it. Ask me if I'm Moorish. I say I carved Lalibela out the side of a mountain and they ignore it. To which I said, What is Lalibela? What is Lalibela? What, what does that even mean, Lalibela? Is that a Haitian word? Is that Creole? Sidebar. I, I, I'm not an expert on medieval architecture, but I know a lot about medieval architecture. Like I got my, I studied with one of the better medievalists in my undergrad. I have a, another degree in art history. I can tell you all about Vézelay and Bourges and Amiens. I mean, well, you want to talk about like Romanesque, and Gothic, early Gothic, high Gothic architecture? 
I'm, I'm one of the best people you can go to France with. Let's put it that way. You want to go to a church in France and have someone tell you what it's all about? That's me. Now, why am I telling you that? Because here I am, and I'm listening to one of my favorite rappers, and he's telling me all about how he carved Lali Bella out. And if I hadn't had just been sitting around stuck in this goddamn basement for a week and a half because of COVID, I never would have thought to even look it up. So me, Mr. Medieval Architecture, didn't even know about some of the most interesting medieval architecture that exists in the world. And why do you think, dear auditors, I don't know about Lalibella? Starts with R and ends with Acism Educational System. It's in Ethiopia. They are these fascinating, we're talking 12th century, 12th, 13th century, around then. Like before even, you know, before the great Gothic architecture of France was even perfected, right? <laughs> Look at them. They are literally carved out of the mountain. I'm going to show you. You are not even going to believe this. Like, like look it up online too to see to see color pictures. You're not even going to believe how awesome these things look. Like, like look at this. This is how it looks from from a distance. Just like a hole in the ground, and the entire church is there, carved out of the mountain. Totally interesting. Totally different Christian architecture. And the thing is, when, when you read this book, when you read this book, I, I it doesn't even have an author to it. This is one of these cheap books you can get on Amazon that seems like it's just almost stapled together from Wikipedia. I really wish the pictures were in color. What you discover is people didn't believe it. People didn't believe that Ethiopians could have made this. People didn't even believe that Ethiopians were Christian. There's a whole messed up story which I can hardly even believe, but it fits in with the themes of this album. And I'm sorry if you're just here for hip-hop. If you're just here for hip-hop analysis, if you're not interested in the long, long, long history of whitewashing and white supremacy in education, then you just might want to just check off and say, I'll check you out next time, Sky. But you gotta. You gotta stay here. Because it's fascinating what happened with this church and the way it was understood. You see, before, you know, in the 4th century, Ethiopia became Christian. Parts of Ethiopia became Christian because of the Coptic missionaries. Yet, in the 16th century, Europeans came to Africa because there was a myth of somebody called Prester John, who was a presumably white person who had a Christian kingdom in the middle of Africa. And you'll never guess what white European settlers did with this information. They used it as an excuse to invade Africa and to colonize Africa looking for a Christian kingdom to the point where when they discovered Ethiopia and discovered it was in fact Christian, they made this map and look at what they called Ethiopia, the kingdom of Prester John. The white supremacy of history is extremely old. It is hewn into the rocks of Lalibela. And Makami sent us there. This is not a coincidence. This is a whole theme of this album. Pointing out things which people don't see. That people don't see because they're not taught. They're not taught because it questions the power. Because it questions the white supremacy, which I benefit from every single day. I am not pretending as though I do not participate in this. I may be describing it in a negative way. That does not mean that I do not benefit from it, to be clear. So what an amazing opening song. What an amazing experience I can have where I, having considered myself to know a lot, just through my education, you know, just through my education, my son had heard of these. So I guess, I guess the school is getting, uh, is getting a little bit better because he had at least heard of, of these churches. So after this, first book report is over. Next verse is twice as long, and here he goes even further. Europe is a concept, and this is God's mirror. Seven billion people on the planet, and the top 1% own 39% autocratic. Meanwhile, what is this, Bernie Sanders? Meanwhile, the bottom 50% owns 1% of everything else. So going after inequality, not just racial inequality, but class inequality. He then makes reference to Entenmann's cookies. I love Entenmann's cookies. I can't get them up here in Rochester. I don't know. Maybe they're like only on the East Coast or something. They're really good cookies. 
there's a weird sort of like echoing effect that he does where he says, aw, ish. And that echo effect would be used a lot on HBO. And then there's another quote from Steve Jobs where he's talking about how Microsoft sucks at making rap. And, and this really does announce this, this other style that will be coming up where Makami is going to, as far as I can tell, based on what projects I've heard after this, shift towards more of a description of why he's a superior rapper versus why he uh, versus you know these other larger themes. Next track is Newark. It's just as good as the first. This could also be a stamp. Super hissy, a very developed sample that kind of changes halfway through. Cool kind of whining sounds. A great hook. When I was a child, I did childish things. Remember that. Okay, that's a whole theme throughout this entire album. The growth, the maturity, the pain of maturity. And as we'll see soon enough, the concept that maturity is not... The process of maturing is perhaps mostly a white privilege. I'm going to get there. You might have heard that last sentence and gone, what are you talking about, Sky? Hold on, I'm going to get there. It's not my fault the world's complicated. Cool, just like the soulful sounds and strings and this relentless style. So here, as opposed to the last song where, you know, he had just he gave a couple lines and gave some space, here he just attacks. But we do it to do it, them do it to pretend, got old enough heads who come in, do them in, and they do it to... They do it to do it, man. They good up in the pen. That's us. They be shooting in the wind. We shooting them. Just on and on, on and on and on and on. Just the attacking style, which he's also quite good at. The outro here is Malcolm X talking about political maturity. Now, I'm not going to include the autobiography of Malcolm X because I talk about it a fair amount on this channel. It is, I think, people ask me, you know, like, like what books should I read? You know, because I'm a professor of literature and, and all that. I think the autobiography of Malcolm X is like the most important book Americans can read. Human beings. Human beings can, I think. I think that's just start there. Just start there. Start with that book. Take some time. You can watch the Spike Lee movie too later. It's not as good. And, and really read that. It leads into the song Laser Guided. The worst beat on the album, it's not even close, but it feels like it's just because it's an excuse for the lyrics. These ridiculously political lyrics. And I'm going to enlarge things here by talking about the, the era that Makami and, and I grew up in. We grew up... <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't edit. So he's going to have to deal with me struggling through my uh, symptoms here. You know, we grew up in Reagan's 80s. Now, Reagan's 80s were great for me. Great for my people. Now, it wasn't great for me personally because my dad hated Ronald Reagan so much. I spent most of my childhood watching him screaming at the television. But, but as far as like my well-being, when people talk about, oh, I wish I lived in the 80s, understand that what they're saying is, is gee, I sure liked racism. <laughs> they don't know that. They're not trying to say that. They watch Stranger Things and they think that's the life I want to live. Uh, it wasn't really like that. For people like me, living where I lived, it was super great. But as Makami explains throughout this album, explicitly and implicitly, it's a hellscape. It was a racist hellscape that was designed to keep him and people that look like him and people in his situation down. Taste Atomic, seeing a little boy eat more than a fat man. First of all, references to the first nuclear bombs, little boy and fat man. Taste Atomic, seeing a little boy eat more than a fat man, Reaganomics, straight demonic. This is the second time this is one of two times he directly references Ronald Reagan and Reaganomics. And ladies and gentlemen, that's my second book. Now, he doesn't mention this book specifically. This book came out after this album came out. I recommend this book, not as highly as I'll recommend others, but I, at the very least, recommend that you read up on the truth about Ronald Reagan and his policies. Now, this book has to be in the context of Trump, but Trump was nothing, nothing. Whatever ill he was able to do was nothing compared to what Ronald Reagan was able to do. It's, it's astonishing that we even think of calling him the worst president ever, knowing that Ronald Reagan existed and did what he did. Oh, okay, he also ended the Cold War, so... Give the devil his due. <laughs> okay, so... But as far as domestic policy and questions of race. This book by Daniel Lux, Reconsidering Reagan, really makes it clear that for his entire career, Ronald Reagan was against civil rights, was very specifically going out against African Americans, ran on that. I have some, uh, some examples here 
uh, I can read to you. You know, on, on page 159 here, it explains how Reaganomics works. If you don't know Reaganomics, it was the principle that he had of cutting taxes for the rich and cutting programs for the poor. That's what it was. As it says in the book, an assault on the social uh, safety net. And everybody understood. Everybody understood at the time. The reason my dad was yelling at the TV, I assume. I don't know. I was too young. The reason was that everyone understood what this was. That by cutting social services, by attacking the people who had the least to lose and making them lose it anyway, welfare programs, government programs of assistance, and making sure that the defense program got all the money and the millionaires got all, all that money, that's how we start to see the wealth gap grow. And that is the era, the area where Ma Kami was growing up. Now he was growing up on one side, I was growing up on the other side. I was growing up up here, he was growing up down here, but we're both living in this same system. Uh, it quotes here, uh, African American Congressman Augustus Hawkins, the role of Robin Hood completely by taking from the poor to give to the rich. Now just a, a funny thing that it says in here, by funny I mean a horrible thing about history, there's actually some chance that this wasn't going to pass. But then some lunatic who was inspired by Taxi Driver wanted to impress Jody Foster, so he shot Reagan. And Reagan lived, and there was so much political capital about surviving that, that the bill passed. Later on in the book, they explain the war on drugs, and that's the other context. And every time we talk about crack rap, and we talk about gangster rap in general, we have to remember we're talking about the crack epidemic. We're not talking about young people who are committing crimes. That is true. But it is much more important and much more useful to see it in the context of the world that was given to the people who became the criminals. What is this world that was given to them, that was provided for them, that was pushed on them? It was not a world of their choosing. It was a world of his making. Very consciously. Very consciously, the war on drugs. Listen to the way. This is a quote from Ronald Reagan. See if you can hear the dog whistles in this from 1981. Only our deep moral values and strong institutions can hold back that jungle and restrain the darker impulses of human nature. This book traces in great detail the history of Reagan's terminology constantly around issues of race using the word jungle over and over and over again. And as this goes on, it explains what changes happened. <laughs> he... He actually compared when he, okay, so uh, in 1982, uh, the war on drugs started when he signed Executive Order 12368, arguably the most destructive executive order of the 20th century. And he compared it to the Battle of Verdun in, in World War I. Like it's a good thing. Do you know what happened in the Battle of, of Verdun in World War I? A couple things. About a million people died. It lasted many months. And nothing really changed. The, there was no benefit. Just people died except the general who led the French would then go on to be the leader of the Nazi puppet, puppet gar, uh, government. So that was the outcome of Verdun. I don't know if Reagan knew exactly what he was doing when he was comparing that. And he also ushered in the federal sentencing guidelines. So when we're talking about the criminality of our criminal justice system, about the unfairness, it all started here. I'm just like two lines in. I'm 23 minutes into this video. I'm two lines in to this Makami song, but I got to spend more time because he is drawing this parallel and he's doing it in his way, which is not explicit. He's not saying, you better read a book, everybody. My name is Makami and I'm here to say, get a library card in a major way. That's what I'm doing. October 12th, 1984, federal sentencing guidelines, mandatory minimums, including the 100 to 1 rule for crack cocaine versus powder cocaine. So the inequality that was baked into this system was baked into the system on purpose. And of all the goddamn, all the goddamn reasons why this worked, why it worked so well, Len Bias, the basketball player who got drafted by the Celtics, who died as I learned as a kid, of a crack overdose, who died, I learned as an adult, of a cocaine overdose. Hmm, why did they say he died of a crack overdose? I'll give you a hint. Starts with R and ends with acist stereotypes. That started a furor in the country. 
this young man cut down in his prime. So even Tip O'Neill, the person who my dad thought was on his side, who we look back in history as the great person who was fighting against, who was the countervailing force against it, all the Democrats in Congress were scared to hell of the midterm elections, so they rushed to support all of these things. Democrats, Republicans alike, pushed the war of drugs. War on drugs. Who cares which one we call it? That's the legacy. That's the truth. That's what we're talking about. Not only are the poor getting poorer and the rich getting richer, but the means by which the poor can get out of poverty are becoming limited. And one of the few means itself is being over-policed and over-enforced. This is what hip-hop tells us. I'm not, I'm not grasping at straws here. This is the exact same stuff that was on the Super Bowl three days ago. It was all there on that stage. You just have to look for it. <sighs> Book report number two is over. The line continues, COINTELPRO. God damn it, Makami. Now you're talking about COINTELPRO. You're talking about the FBI and their policies of intentionally putting people into black subversive, black revolutionary organizations, any revolutionary organizations, and getting intelligence to tear them apart from the inside. Noise cell phone, know they behind it, send vaccines to, with AIDS to Haiti, CDC, them hate the babies. When they rape in my mama and I'm too sick to stop it. That's one of the lines in this song. So he goes beyond just talking about the plight of himself as an African American uh, living in, in Newark, New Jersey, but he's also talking about the plight of people from Haiti, the, the, the plight of Haitians and the way they've been victimized by many different forces in the world when they raped my mom and I'm too sick to stop it. An outro from Tupac Shakur, don't support our phonies. So there's all these different quotes. Now that we're done with Steve Jobs, the rest of them are all interesting. We have uh, Tupac here. Next song is called Breast Milk, interesting title. Sultry, soft 70s beat, shuffling, agreeable drums. Starts off kind of goofy. Does a hurricane have an eye? I don't really know what he means by that, but then he gets super political. So why you try to avoid the question? Like a mm, skin color ain't the reason why it's more detentions. Is this country apple pie? Interesting question, a slight callback, I believe, to H. Uh, H. Brown, who I'll be discussing at great length, who said that violence is American as ch cherry pie. Because every time we get one foot out the grave, they try to pull us in. They shot Pac, they shot Martin, they shot Malcolm. They shot Huey and Fred. F it, I stopped counting. And then what does Mock do? He gives us two bars to just sit and relax. But we're not relaxed. We're thinking of the other people that they got, the forces of white supremacy, which are acting and have been acting. After that space, Captain Ahab pursued the white whale. When Emmett Till whistled at a white girl, they slew him like quail. Black boy, you ain't no human being. You better curb your ambitions. Slide right up in that kitchen and do your thing. Make your mama proud, buck. Run fast, jump, run fast, jump high. Go to class, get a job. Give them hours up. Poor, then maybe you can get some, or at least pretty light-skinned broad if you admit you dumb. Ends with that beautiful verse that moving verse going all over, again, this continued history, mistreatment, the false dreams that are sold to people in the lower classes. And then we end with a quote from H. Rap Brown, in which he describes how people fear and hate Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X, but not just people, how African Americans, how black people feared and hated them because they were taught to be afraid to hate them. Second reference of Malcolm X, but this is where I really need to take some time to talk about H. Rap Brown. The fact that you've never heard of him, maybe you have. If you have heard of him, do a victory lap in the, in the comment section. Say, hey, I'd heard of him, Sky. I don't know how you don't know about Lali Bella. I don't know how you don't know about this stuff, you ignorant schmuck. Go ahead and say that. I'd never heard of him. Mock sent me to H. Rap Brown. And I can tell you this book the title which I am not going to say, I say, is one of the best books on the civil rights movement and on the revolutionary movements I've ever read. I mean, this belongs right next to the autobiography of Malcolm X. Now, he did change his name in jail to Abdullah, I mean, Jamil Abdullah Al-Amin. At the time, he was called H-Rap, so I'm just going to be calling him that for now. And this book is filled 
So it's a political autobiography. And he was like the leader of SNCC, you know, a very important revolutionary movement. Uh, he was, you know, he, there, he, he talks about when he met LBJ, the president of the United States, and everyone else, all the other black leaders were saying how thankful they were to be there. And he was like, I'm not thankful to be here. I want you to do something. It's awesome. He says some things in here which I think pertain to the album quite explicitly. Babies become men without passing through childhood. There's a theme in this album about maturity, but it's also, and this does get explicit later, about the lack of childhood that African Americans have in America. The way the society is constructed to push from infancy into adulthood. I, I had a childhood. I had the luxury of caring about Transformers and whether or not Mike Greenwell was going to help the Red Sox win a World Series in 1988. He didn't. But a lot of what's described in here and in the album that we're listening to is this sense of not being able to pass through childhood. Other lines. What was the future? That was something white folks had. He talks a lot about violence and about how white men legitimize and delegitimize violence according to their own needs. I will say something that's uh, true of a lot of these books, which is that to a certain degree, intersectionality, first of all, is kind of a new thing. Second of all, it's sort of a luxury in a way. So he is fairly homophobic at times in this book uh, as a sort of warning. I mean, not super explicitly, but I mean, not like the worst stuff you've ever read, but casually. Um, but anyways. And what I find interesting about, about all, these, all these 60s figures, especially these ones that are, that are mentioned and highlighted by Ma Kami here, I'm white, as you might be able to tell. And the hippies, the, the, the counterculture movement of the 60s, betrayed itself. The, the, the young people who were trying to change the world betrayed the movement themselves. They did have access to the power. They could have changed the world, and they didn't. They just settled into the bourgeois life. And that's what I always say to any young revolutionaries coming up. You come see me in 30, when you're 35, and if you don't have a white-collar job, I'll eat a guitar pick, you know? Like, it's just the way the world goes. But that's not what happened to the black revolutionaries. Like, it makes sense that I feel disdain towards the hippie generation because growing up as Generation Xer, I sort of saw how they just sold out all their values and just became selfish. The black revolutionaries never had that chance. They were all blown up or shot or put in jail for bad reasons, for fake reasons, with COINTELPRO. All of them were destroyed by the system that they were trying to fight. The system which now we all recognize and can all say is a problem, they were destroyed by bullets and by jail cells. So it's a real tragedy that, it's, that, that, we can, that we sort of group together the 60s all together. Because some of the revolutionaries never even had a chance to sell out, never even had a chance to get selfish, because they were too busy bleeding to death or being locked up for no reason. Have you thought of that? I think I, I would like, and this has happened, I think we really need a huge revolution in the way we talk about black revolutionaries of the 60s and 70s. I think we need to bring them back up to the front. We need to stop saying, how come nobody does that anymore? And we start emptying out the jails and we start, we start treating Angela Davis the way we treated Maya Angelou, if not more. We start talking about these figures as figures who were ascending and then were cut down. Okay. This, by the way, of all the books I'm going to be talking about, you should get. Okay? High, high recommendations to get this book. It is an excellent... It's also fun. I mean, fun, I mean not fun. It's easy to read. It's not a slog, the way that it's written. Interestingly enough, okay, I can't even put this book away. This has to do with hip-hop history. You see, he has a whole section in here about the dozens, you know, like your mama jokes. And then he moves on to talk about signifying, which is like your mama jokes, but it's an attack on one person. As he says, it's a way of expressing your own feelings. And if this isn't rap music, then what the hell is? Man, you must not know. 
You must don't know who I am. I'm the sweet Peter Jeter, the womb beater, the baby maker, the cradle shaker, the deer slayer, the buck binder, the woman finder. Known from the Gold Coast to the rocky shores of Maine, rap is my name and love is my game. I'm the bed tucker, the C word plucker, the mother effer, the milkshaker, the record breaker, the population maker, the gunslinger, the baby bringer, the humdinger, the P word ringer. He just goes on and on. And this is 1969. You know, we talk a lot about the last poets and about the origins of hip hop and how they go back to Jamaica and all that. Yes, 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 yes. But he calls himself H. Rap Brown because he could do this, which he calls rapping. And the thing that blew my mind the most that I somehow did not know was when I read these lines on page 28. Yes, I am Hemp the Demp, the women's pimp. Women fight for my delight. I said, no, the line is, imp the dimp, the ladies pimp, the women fight for my delight. That comes from Sugar Hill Gang. That comes from Rapper's Delight. It turns out, Raheem and then Big Hank both took that line from the first commercially successful rap song in music history, Rapper's Delight, New Jersey represent, I suppose, from 1979, took the lyrics from H. Rap Brown, meaning that this exact book is literally in the foundational DNA of the popularizing of hip hop music. Did you know that? Black History Month. That's, that's why, Kanye, the, the history does matter. The future, of course, matters more. But the history matters. Because we don't even know this stuff. I don't know this stuff. And I'm actually paying attention. I'm actually looking a little bit. And it's all hidden. And it's hidden because of white supremacy. God damn, this is a fascinating album. Has that been lost, by the way? This is a really good album. I've been listening to it like over and over again. My son's like, how many times are you gonna listen to this? I'm like, as much as I can. Like, I am enjoying listening to this album. It's got a great groove, a great feeling. Really, it's just, it's some of the most enjoyable rap music I've heard all year. Next song is called Egypt. Great beat, very strong bass, very simple verse. It opens up with a refrain. And this is an important refrain. This is where uh, Mach does something throughout this entire album a lot, where he talks about himself, but he's personifying Pan-African people. I mean, just basically all blackness all over the world. Ain't nobody paid me for all the ish that I've done. And I believe this is metaphorical for all of the Africans of the world. As it says in this book, New Dimensions in African History, there's long been an attempt on the part of some European scholars to deny that Egypt was part of Africa. That's true. I think that's why this is called Egypt. The hook actually reminds me a little bit of Pross from, uh, from the Fugees. I believe it's him. On the, on the Staying Alive, on the Wyclef album, there's that little bit where like, there's a little breakdown. It just reminds me a lot of that, of that Staying Alive uh, breakdown. After the second hook, he just goes off on banks. And the history of international banks and exploitation of countries like Haiti is long and storied. The exploitation of banks is long and storied. So it's amazing when he has this line, Deutsche Bank here, Barclays there, BNP, every goddamn where, that's the Banque Nationale de Paris, the National Bank of Paris, HSBC, Royal Bank 2, JP Morgan, we thank you. It's this great anti-rich, anti-bank statement. He goes on to talk about it's easier for a Benz to pass through a hole in your drawers than for a rich man to roll with the god, a play on the camel going through the needle's eye. And then he directly references this. He says, this, that, H. Rap Brown, die and die with M.C. Escher inside. So this is the second time. So the first time he quoted... Uh, H. Rap Brown talking about Malcolm X. I'll include that in the description, by the way. Uh, I, I found where he gave that talk. And now he is here directly referencing it. But then as though he's having this just long dialogue, this long conversation, this, this push, he's pushing us into all this knowledge. I don't read. That's what he's saying. I don't read. <sighs> okay. He doesn't read. He do hey, he doesn't read. Who doesn't read? Who doesn't make these kinds of references? Uh, he then quotes John Henrik Clark. This whole thing is restoration of confidence. It's been the role of these handmaidens of colonialism to destroy your confidence in yourself. 
You don't believe that you can look like a god. Time for another book report. New Dimensions in African History by Yosef ben Yokanen and John Henry Clark, the person who just said that quote. It's an interesting book. It's, I don't recommend it. I mean, I recommend reading it. I don't necessarily recommend uh, buying it. I think you should find it. It's good. Um, there's a little too much anti-Jewish stuff in here. Um, it's nuanced in a way, so it's not just, you know, straight hate, um, but it's adjacent to that. Again, that whole intersectionality is a luxury idea. Um, but what I like about this, and why it's definitely worth consulting, uh, is this effort, this necessary effort, to reimagine African history, to stop allowing it to be co-opted, to stop referring to Ethiopia as Prester John's kingdom. These, these people, these people who have darker skin than I do, are just as capable of anything that people of my skin are capable of doing, and they have been for the past couple thousand years. I do like one quote in this book. Um, it's interesting. It's a series of lectures, um, and some of them are better than others. Like he has a, There's an interesting one about the scramble for Africa discussing the long history of how Africa has been colonized way before the 19th century. Um, is this quote here, though. I think the one thing you have to always remember in any educational system is that the powerful people never train you how to take that power away from them and that your oppressor cannot afford the luxury of educating you uh, and asking you to become his oppressor. Interesting quote, interesting idea. But again, I'd really go after that HRAP if you have to just get one book here. Then we get to Sour Sweet, which opens up with Angela Davis, talking about carrying weapons. Now, I was going to have an Angela Davis breakdown. I ordered a book of hers. It's not here yet. Don't worry, I'm gonna talk about it on another video because it's about the prison industrial system. And guess what I end up talking a lot about? But she does reference how my next book report, <laughs> W.E.B. Du Bois, it's so hard to pronounce his name, not French. W.E.B. Du Bois uh, used to carry a gun himself and the difficulty and the need to arm yourself when you are under so much threat. This will be a quick book report. This is one of those books that needs to be in your library along with the autobiography of Malcolm X. Like, you just, you just, I know. Young people, they don't have libraries. I get it. It's not a good move. It's not a good, have a library. It's okay if it's 20 books. You don't, you don't have to be Ron Burgundy with the mahogany and the Corinthian leather. You don't need that. But, but there's like certain books you just need to have. And this is definitely one of them. And you don't believe me, I'll include a link in the description as well to just the first chapter of this. I mean, the first, like 1903 he wrote this. And it, it's, it's astounding how beautifully he writes about the position that he was born into. The difficulty of being born black, of, as he said, being born a problem and being seen as a problem about the veil of racism, about the, the double consciousness. You've probably heard that before in other better, um, other better commentators on race than me. The way he describes it just so efficiently. It takes 10 minutes, okay? Follow that link and read. And tell me you shouldn't, shouldn't get this book. It's fascinating and it's foundational text in all these things that we're studying here. Sour Sweet has a nice kind of light Motown sample. Uh, kind of a funny title because, you know, Sour, I believe, is short for Sig Sauer, the German gun, and then Sweet as like a series of things as opposed to like tasting sweet. But it's a play on Sour and Sweet uh, as in the bittersweetness because this is about like growing up. And I think this is about his maturing and sort of maturing out of the streets. Uh, I was man with too much weight, shook too much hands with too many goons. Uh, you might get shot. And then finally he said, I have to, I had to go, I had to know, I had to go. This is very similar, I think, to when I was young, I, I have to grow up now and I have to be a king. He does talk about how much he misses this life, how much he misses uh, being in, ca you know, in capers. He has nice kind of, he changes up the flow on the second verse, a little bit more of an attacking flow. A young fellow ever managed to bellow those troubled thoughts thorough. Half-stepping rappers get rattled. I brush it off civil. What you think I'm in back of the shuttle? Just nice kind of attack. And then ends with Angela Davis. Uh, another quote from Angela Davis. And just a, a quick word in case you didn't know. You know who uh, made sure that Angela Davis got fired from her job and uh, put in jail? 
You, you know who was responsible for that? Who was governor of California when that happened? You know who used that for political advantage to connect more with his racist uh, voters? Ronald Reagan did. Anyways. Go ahead, put him on Mount Rushmore. I don't care. I'm never gonna go there anyway. <laughs> Russian Dolls is the next song, a cool kind of languid beat with guitar, kind of winding strings and fuzzy shattered drums. Probably one of the better beats on the album for its sort of complexity. If there's one flaw I sort of find with Makami is just sometimes the way he talks about women is just a little too misogynist, although I think I'm oversimplifying things. So he starts off interesting and says like, I love you in multiple different languages. And then he even starts off with this interesting line, beautiful isn't necessarily pretty, and pretty is hardly ever something really beautiful. What I like about this song in particular is this weird flow where he's like whispering and then he's doubling up his voice, talking over it. And he's kind of harmonizing and has a very kind of interesting sound to it. He then goes, okay, so now I'm just going to get to make some references that don't have to do with anything very complicated or challenging. I'm talking about Carl Perkins and Steve Martin. So Elvis, okay, ain't nothing but a hound dog. I guess that wasn't a Carl Perkins song. I think that's a Libra Stroller. From Elvis to Steve Martin. So he says, nothing, you ain't nothing but a hound dog. When they told me you was high class, that was a lie. You a style ho. <laughs> so that's kind of funny, right? Because it said you were high class, that was just a lie. That's the lyric to the original song, hound dog. Um, but instead he's putting down this woman. All I need is this bag, maybe this car, these kind of tires, and I'm fly, baby, that's all. Baby, baby, that's all. I think that's a reference to the movie The Jerk with Steve Martin where he hits bottom and he used to be rich. He's like, I don't need you. I don't need anything. I just need this ashtray. That's all I need. I, and the paddle game. I need the ashtray and the paddle game and that's all I, and this remote control. And he just keeps on going through his house, picking up random things. It's a, it's a great moment in comedy. I think that's what this is. Like, I don't need you. I just need this bag and this car and this money. So here's the thing, that sounds super, super, super misogynist and like he's putting down women, which to a certain degree he is. But actually what I think it is, is more about this maturing question that's been throughout the entire album. Because he talks about how he's not allowing chemicals to influence his perspective. In the second verse he talks about, you keep letting liquor tell you she's a winner, you're gonna know what it's like. Essentially what he's doing is he's talking about the way men allow themselves to get high and messed up and perhaps even messed up through lust or for you know carnal desires or whatever. And then that draws them towards these women who are not good for them. So I think it's actually a song about maturing past this and not necessarily just a, a sort of tired attack on women, as far as I can tell. Gnarly Dude is the next song. Uh, after the very weird double-tracked voice on the last one, he's just straight spitting. It's got this cool aggravating beat that doesn't quite start, like the drums sound sort of sputtering. This guitar line like like drones, almost like teen spirit. Nice kind of very intentionally political lyrics, like call me Cassius Clay one more time. You know, I'm gonna apologize. I got I should stop calling him by his old name. I am only going to refer to him as Jamil Abdullah Al Amin. He changed his name to that. I'm not gonna call him Cassius Clay. I apologize, Mr. Al Amin. And then the hook, you know, it's all right, you're all going to die anyway. And then the second verse, he talks about Robert Johnson. Now, unfortunately, I'm down in the basement. I can't go upstairs because I don't want to contaminate my family. Robert Johnson, if you don't know, is one of the founders of all guitar music that's ever existed. He died very young. He was able to play guitar where it sounded like he was at least two people while he was just one person. And he was famous for selling his soul to the devil, and that's why he got so good at guitar. Which, of course, is just a lie that's propagated because we don't want to give any credit to a young African-American for having some kind of amazing talent on par with Mozart because we couldn't possibly allow that kind of genius to exist uh, within a black body, so we have to really lean into this concept that he sold his soul to the devil. There is no devil. So, he calls himself, it's the new Robert Johnson minus all the gossip, no need to sell my spirit because my style is philosophic, philanthropic, my mind is in the cockpit, soul is in control, tower nine, and stop it, crosses the Lord said it's building to be born. Just a beautiful line, putting himself as a Robert Johnson who didn't need to sell his soul, much like Robert Johnson himself didn't sell his soul. To be fair, 
I mean, I believe Robert Johnson like used that to his advantage, like that rumor to his advantage. I believe. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I actually, what I know about Robert Johnson is very uh, spotty. It is now longer than one of my classes, 50 minutes. Uh, I like how he talks about having curbside panache, street corner je ne sais quoi. I love any time he speaks French. He says F Bill, Bill O'Reilly. I like that as well. I think there's some uh, Creole there towards the end. And then he quotes Marilyn Monroe, how do you know what a pretty girl wants? So Lodolo starts off with a Nas quote, Nas quote, meaningful in this context. Again, with Tupac, he's trying to put himself in this continuum of rappers. Tupac and Nas are both rappers who managed to split that difference like Kanye, between the street and the, the highbrow crowd, right? I think that's an intentional reference. A uh, drum-led beat with a very sultry uh, keyboard. Here, he's really moving into his, what I call the ghost face style, just very spitfire abstraction. Shotgun detergent, soapy beer piss, S-lists, late night with urban fjord niche, we, niche, we spear fish, take bites out of sturgeon prawn dish, beware, beword, ain't heard of y'all, but y'all heard we was raw, we can't miss, just very there. And then he chops up and slows down, which he's been doing throughout the album a couple times, where he just sort of slows things down and, and uh, includes chopped up, slowed down beats. Pure fire water, sanctified dope, high top, Wally. I think the Wally is an intentional reference because uh, Ghostface Killer would often talk about Wally's, meaning Clark's Wallaby shoes. The next song is called Wheaties. And it's got cool kind of like odd chord changes, sort of a 70s sound, chorus effects everywhere. It's my least favorite beat on the album. Maybe my second favorite after uh, uh, that, I think the third track. But the lyrics here. Remember when I was talking about Reaganomics and about the, the growing up in the 80s and how a lot of the rappers who are trying to tell you about their life, they're not trying to tell you how cool it is to be a criminal. They're trying to tell you how terrible it is to grow up in these situation. I think Makami's verse here is a masterclass in this verse of growing up in Reagan's America. Roach kisses on the corner of my mouth. Breath stinking. Mouse-ish all over the couch. I'm just thinking. Grandpa homeless by the park in a tercel. Right behind the hot dog cart. My mm, swell. Bradley Corton's by the droves selling packs. Myrtle Avton's by the groves be selling crack. G. Willikers be. If I could just relax, then these feelings would leave. Booby Mom stole the money. I gave that mm, Sega Genesis game Ron sold. Ain't nothing coming. Take your food stamps to the Szechuan and get some cash. They give you like a dollar for every two and a half. Every night it's some ish. I wake up in the morning, see some white sneakers. See some sneakers on the wire. Baby, life's a ish. I'm only 10 years old, but I'm going on 40. Old head said, yo, I see you growing up shorty. I go back to this book by Al Amin. Babies become men without passing through childhood. I'm only 10 years old, but going on 40. This image of the homeless grandfather and the different locales in his town where people are selling drugs and not being able to afford the video games. Like I had a, I had a video, I had Super Nintendo, I had Sega Genesis, I had Nintendo, so awesome being an 80s kid, angry video game nerd, everything's so great for me, right? All that nostalgia, all that nostalgia, nostalgia is a, uh, it's a byproduct of privilege. Is that true? Kind of. I don't know. Just the way he writes this entire verse, like talking about like selling food stamps and the bad deals that you get, the details that he's giving here. I mean, this is like a realist masterpiece portrait of his childhood. It's a spectacular song. Lyrically, it's spectacular. I used to thug her, parenthesis sweetness is the next song. Cool kind of organ solo with occasional guitar line. Um, again, more space that he's able to give here, especially with this little guitar line uh, in between lines. Next song, Kinglish, has an intro talking about Charlie Parker, but also about other forgotten greats, which is sort of a theme of this album as well, like people who are forgotten and overlooked. Jazzy piano, kind of hard jazzy piano with pauses in the middle of the phrase, which again is an example of that space. Nix for Nixon, this is, this is Ronald Reaganomics in Perdition with the Thompson in the Kitchen. Just going on and on again, still emphasizing this this life in 
80s Reagan. Kind of a weak chorus, which closes out, but what's nice is that Hardwired, the final song, starts with singing, so it creates a nice kind of segue between his singy style and his singy style. And then here, I really like Hardwired, the chorus here, has these strings that keep crescendos. And then we have just some essential uh, Makami style lyrics. I'm a 100% Haitian boy, you know I'm going in. Sel bagay mwen, promet se bon bagay o komenem. I can't lie, I'm sort of special, I ride for my friends. That uh, Creole line, according to Google Translate, says, the only thing I promise is that you know me well. I love it anytime he integrates Creole. As I often will say, um, rap made by first and second generation immigrants is different than other rap because part of its audience are people who are multilingual. In order to fully understand the experience, you have to understand multi-languages. You can't just speak Creole and you can't just speak English. You have to speak both. And that puts you, when you are treated by society, is always on the outs. In this music, you're able to create an in, and that in is people like you who have experienced this experience of being on the outs, which not even other black Americans can understand unless they've also had that added layer of alienation through immigration. That's 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 what's in that line. That's so so you hear I'm just saying blah 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 blah. But, but what I hear and what I hope you'll you're going to hear is that's a code. He's speaking to his people. So if you can understand both those things, you go, ah somebody has this experience too. The whole thing ends with him saying, Remember you're a king. This goes back to some of the lines from Clark all the way throughout, that, that this whole push, this very new push for black history, African history, African American history, all of it, it's very new. And it's trying to undo this educational system which has intentionally served the needs of white supremacy. That's why I spend so much time with these, with these books and by trying to get you to read these books or at least to think about them or at least to go to the, go to the description and watch these videos and read, and read these chapters, you know? Because we, we have to undo it. And the fact that my son has studied a little bit of African history is a sign that something happened. You know, the 90s did something. We made some progress. You know, I'm, I'm teaching classes at the college where I am, which didn't exist when I went to college, which are emphasizing a lot of things about African and African American history. You know, we are making progress. But not enough. As I said, I was able to buy those books partly because of the help of, of my Patreons. That's these guys, these, these folks right here. I keep getting more. It's awesome. I'm up to like 39. I never would have believed that I have that many. So thank you to all of you. You see your name up there. You help me buy music. You help me buy books. You help me do my channel. So let me know in the comments what you thought of this video. Smash the like bucket. Please subscribe. And there's the camera.